Hey everyone, good evening. We are here with another free brain health lecture at I Care For Your Brain. I am Dr. Karen Sullivan. I am a board certified clinical neuropsychologist. I practice in North Carolina. But in order to reach as many of you as I possibly can, we meet here every Wednesday at six o'clock. And the reason I do this is to provide you with a science-based voice to counteract some of the sea out there of uh, opinions and um, demands and uh, enticing claims from the brain fitness industry. So who do I mean when I say that? I mean the supplements, the brain game, makers and uh, tonight we're going to be focusing on another one of those treatments that is often touted as healing the brain being able to reverse cognitive impairment um, being able to help you get your life back so it's very important to me to look through the evidence to see is this fact or fiction is this something that i should recommend to my patients i always stay I'd like to think I stay very open-minded when thinking about what will help people, but the truth is, is you have to look at the evidence, you have to look at the data, and so that's what we're gonna do tonight. We are going to talk about hyperbaric oxygen therapy with a specific focus on traumatic brain injury. And the first thing I wanted to do is hopefully uh, check in with you to see if you can hear me better than you typically do, because Thanks to Wendy, one of our followers, she was able to give me some feedback that it wasn't always that easy to hear me. So we are trying to use a microphone tonight, so hopefully it makes the experience a little bit better for you. Um, our topic tonight is definitely controversial. It is widely debated and sometimes even confusing to know where exactly the recommendation should lie. This was another one of those topics that was brought to us by a listener and that I read in a, a message and thought, you know what, that would really make a great um, topic for us. TBI, traumatic brain injury, also of course is a public health issue, a neuropsychological problem. There is a lot of stress that can go along with it, disability, loss of income, reduced quality of life. Um, the problem is we really do have a lack of effective treatments. We're pretty good with the acute phase of the injury, people getting to the hospital, knowing how to keep people alive. But of course, what we all really care about is that quality of life that people are left with, right? So we clearly have a need to figure out what to do to help folks in the long term with TBI. and hyperbaric oxygen therapy is one of those things that gets talked about as helping people. So sometimes you can hear things online about uh, HBOT, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Maybe if you go to a support group, you heard of somebody getting it. We're naturally drawn to things that are going to make us better when there are promises, right? But what I always try to reinforce with you all is it's very important to not just get caught up in claims that we actually need to see proof or something that gets as close to proof and the truth as we possibly can. So what is TBI? Why don't we start there? Well, it can happen from a shock to the brain from external forces, or it can happen from a result of something that actually happens within the person's body, within their brain. Over 10 million people a year in the United States get a TBI. Um, the major causes are motor vehicle accident, falls, and violence, including fighting and attempted suicide. Alcohol is involved in TBI anywhere from 35 to 81% of the time. That is a lot. The internal causes for TBI can be anything from drowning, suffocating, cardiac arrest, and stroke. TBI is a very large umbrella um, term, and there's many different reasons why people have had their TBI. You can either have a mild TBI or you can have a moderate to severe TBI. And the way we figure that out is primarily through the level of the loss of consciousness that happened following the injury. So in mild TBI, it would be a loss of consciousness from zero to 30 minutes or what we call an alteration of consciousness. So what this means is people who get confused, they're unable to say exactly where they live, exactly what happened to them immediately after the car accident. There is something called a post-traumatic amnesia under 24 hours. So what does post-traumatic amnesia mean? This is a state of confusion, kind of like distorted memories or a loss of memory for the 24 hours that followed the event that gave someone the TBI. 
When they do a test that's called the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is basically a test to determine the level of consciousness when medical providers get to the person, um, it's between 13 and 15. So that scale goes from zero to 15. Zero is the absolute worst and 15 is cognizant, can, you know, talking, the ability to track eyes, to be oriented. It means you're really in pretty good neurological shape. With mild TBI, the deficits really are brief. They should last only about two weeks for most people. Most people say it kind of feels like you have a bad flu. Um, there's normal brain imaging in a mild traumatic brain injury, meaning your CT scan shows that you did not have a skull fracture, you don't have a bleed. Um, but if there is abnormal imaging, meaning they do show those things, then that's what we call a complicated mild traumatic brain injury. Okay, so most people, like I said, two to three weeks and they're good. Up to three months is considered to be the typical maximum for symptoms. If you go beyond three months, what science tells us is that those symptoms are typically not coming from a neurological cause. Many people that I see as a neuropsychologist are complaining about trouble with attention, trouble um, being able to stay organized and multitask. And when you assess them, what you find out is they actually had an undiagnosed neck injury, or they have chronic headaches that's distracting them, or there was emotional changes. It was a traumatic event that caused the TBI or they are depressed now because they haven't been able to get back to work. So when changes, we call them post-concussive syndrome changes, when they happen after three months, we really need to start looking at other possible causes. So at least 90% of folks with those longer term post-concussive symptoms have a co-occurring symptom like depression, a substance abuse issue, post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic pain, these kind of things. Moderate and severe TBI, we typically kind of lump together. So these are folks who had a loss of consciousness over a half hour, um, the post-traumatic amnesia, trouble with memory, things seeming foggy lasted more than one day. Their Glasgow coma scale was under 13. Okay. And really the care for these people is around saving their lives between 19 and 36% of people who go to a hospital with a moderate to severe TBI don't make it. Okay. They pass away. So we start to think about things like medically induced um, comas, um, making sure they don't have seizures. Um, this is where craniotomies come in to relieve some of the pressure. Over 50% of people who live through a moderate to severe TBI will be left with some degree of disability. And of course, this cuts across cognitive, you know, meaning your thinking and your memory, your processing speed to behavior changes, uh, mood changes, behavior. And they're at increased risk for further neurological damage from things like developing epilepsy. We actually talked about that last time we were together. Once you have a TBI, there's really three separate but overlapping uh, phases that happen. There's the acute phase, the subacute phase, and the chronic phase. So the acute phase is basically the 24 hours after you have the TBI. The subacute phase is in the next few days, and the chronic phase is everything that's after the few days, okay? So in the acute phase, the immediate phase, the effects of TBI are all over the place. So some people have damage um, to a specific part of the brain. For other people, it's multiple lobes in the brain. For some people, if it's an oxygen related issue, like a cardiac arrest, it's the whole brain. Different parts of the brain have different needs for different amounts of oxygen. We're gonna talk about that a little bit tonight. So those areas are the ones that tend to get damaged first when oxygen dips down below the threshold that we need to support cell, brain cell health. Um, of course, following the immediate injury, there is the subacute and the chronic phases. And a lot of times this is a very complex series of events that's different for each person, but typically this can involve swelling, which we call edema, reduced oxygen, just where you're not getting enough, you're getting oxygen, but you know, it's not at the 98% the level, it's, it's down. This is called hypoxia and something called ischemia, which is similar, which is, just means a restriction in the blood supply. There's also something called intracranial pressure that happens a lot after TBI. And what this means is basically that the pressure in the brain increases and this can cause further restriction of oxygen and cause damage. So the signs of increased intracranial pressure most commonly are a very intense headache, 
nausea, vomiting, um, definitely confusion, double vision, um, people's eyes not really responding to light, so the pupil not expanding and contracting. Anyone who's had a craniotomy or needed to have any kind of a brain surgery after a TBI probably had increased intracranial pressure. Um, the problem is it really presses on the brain structures and further reduces the blood flow. All of this then results in a big old cascade of not so good things like chemicals that typically aren't in the brain uh, at certain levels getting very high at an imbalance of electrolytes. And this is all part of that kind of secondary injury. So regardless of all that different stuff, what is clear is that a reduction and a loss of oxygen in the brain is a huge part of a TBI, which of course gets us to this treatment of the additional oxygen from the hyperbaric chamber. So oxygen is of course delivered through our blood. The brain needs a steady, constant supply of a high level of oxygen. The hippocampus, which are the memory centers in the brain, and the prefrontal cortex here in the front need the most oxygen. So if you even had a uh, mild to moderate brain injury, you might, pardon me, a moderate brain injury, not mild, those symptoms should um, go away, like I said, after a few weeks, a few months at most. Once you get into moderate, you probably are going to have some long-term damage from this reduction in oxygen. Um, all the cells need oxygen, of course, in our, in our body, but the brain is pretty amazing. It needs three times as much oxygen as the muscles do. Even though it only takes up 2% of our body weight, it requires more than 20% of the oxygen in our body at any given time. Brain cells are really sensitive to any decreases in oxygen and do not function very well once it dips down after about six minutes. Once we get into eight to nine minutes without any oxygen, you're definitely getting um, brain cell death. Um, with no oxygen, the brain cells basically can't work. They can't access any fuel. The main fuel is oxygen and glucose, so blood sugar, and basically we can't convert the glucose into energy without the oxygen. So uh, basically the brain has a lot less power, a lot less gasoline in the tank. So I'm setting you up to get the point that oxygen is absolutely critical for brain function. So isn't it very logical to think that if a reduction in oxygen is part of the problem, we need to increase oxygen to come up with a solution. If it was that easy, we might not even be having this talk tonight. Uh, it's that translation from what we clearly need clinically to help the brain heal into what this treatment of hyperbaric oxygen treatment actually is that we need to dissect a little bit more. So what is this treatment? They say it's designed to increase the amount of oxygen that's in the blood that can then be transferred to the tissues, including the brain. So it involves putting the person in an airtight vessel and increasing the pressure in that vessel to about 1.4 times greater than normal air pressure and moving up the oxygen to 100%. Now in everyday normal air, we're at about 21% of oxygen. So that's a really big difference. So under these conditions, your lungs can actually get about three times more the oxygen than they can in normal air. What they say is if you do this for two hours a day for eight to 10 weeks, um, that you will be helped. So we have to figure out what are they saying? What are the naysayers saying? We're gonna get to all that. So these chambers, hyperbaric chambers, are medical devices and they need to be mandated through the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA. So we need clearance for them for specific uses. So to be approved for a specific use, the FDA has to look at all the evidence, decide if it's safe and effective. But remember, this is not anything besides clearing it for marketing, okay? Going into one of these chambers is a very social experience, and I want you to keep that in mind. So depending on the treatment plan, people can uh, go into a singular tube, they can go with, there's kind of multi-tubes where multiple um, people can be in there, there's a team of medical providers, there's hyperbaric technicians, there's a lot of interaction that happens. Remember that when we start to talk about the evidence. So how did hyperbaric, uh, therapy come about and how is it related to TBI specifically? Well, this actually goes back to the 1960s when um, the first studies were done on dogs and rats. They were given sham or fake TBIs through 
oh, all sorts of chemical and mechanical ways that they, they hurt these laboratory animals. Not the best, but that's how we, we know a lot about the brain. And basically they were treated with additional oxygen. And what they found out were that these animals had significantly improved outcomes really that it reduced the chance that they would die from the TBI, okay? So the first reports that came out talked about less brain swelling, reducing the pressure in the brain, protecting the brain, very, very broad terms. But you have to remember, these were done in animals, right? So it's a good start, but of course, much more work had to be done. So in the 1960s, doctors in the Netherlands figured out that serious skin conditions like gangrene were getting a lot better when you gave people increased oxygen. In 1965, a Japanese doctor used it to treat carbon dioxide poisoning in a group of people that were in a coal mine fire. And he determined that the carbon monoxide was suffocating the red blood cells, which transports the oxygen. And so if you could get more oxygen, it was a way to kind of remove this from the system. So doctors have known that hyperbaric oxygen therapy has definitely helped soft tissue injury for a long time. That's pretty well scientifically established. So burns heal faster. Um, we know that oxygen can help the immune response and that we can activate different chemicals and enzymes and basically speed up the healing process. This is definitely established. So in any good wound clinic, you're typically gonna find a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, okay? So there are 14 cleared FDA conditions for the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy at this time. The first thing I often think of is scuba divers, right? Getting the bends treated. So the other ones, um, and that is one of the 14 that is approved. The other ones are anytime someone has an air or a gas embolism, so a bubble of air or gas um, that is caused by air in the arteries. Um, hyperbaric is definitely helpful in reducing that safely. Carbon monoxide poisoning, a crush injury. So if someone gets hit with a piece of heavy equipment and there's a loss of blood flow to a limb, for example, they know that the hyperbaric helps them. Um, different kinds of wounds from type two diabetes, severe anemia, interestingly enough. Um, intracranial abscess, so this is a brain cyst. Um, and this is very common in people who have abnormal immune systems. So any kind of autoimmune disorder, a lot of people with HIV get these. That's as close as we actually get to something that's FDA approved as it relates to the brain. The other thing are like flesh eating bacteria, definitely you know, osteomyelitis, so chronic bone infections, um, injury from doing radiation. If a skin graft isn't taking, they'll put someone in the chamber, a burn from either fire or heat. And different types of hearing loss can actually be treated if your hearing loss happens in a very short amount of time, over three days, if you lose at least 30 decibels, they have shown that hyperbaric will help you. That is actually the latest approved indication and that was added in 2011. So what is the mechanism? How does this actually work? Well, pretty simple, right? You lost oxygen, there was damage, let's put oxygen in, try to reverse the damage or help the tissue around the damage be as healthy as it can be to compensate. So it's very basic, right? More oxygen, the more healing. So um, when they start talking about TBI and hyperbaric oxygen now, when I do my internet search, I start to see some buzzwords that raise the hair on my arms. These words are neuroprotection, um, you know, talking about getting your life back, um, brain healing, reverse a brain injury. Very, very few, if ever, are those claims accurate. And they should actually be a warning sign to you that we're potentially entering a marketing zone and we're getting out of the world of science and medical care, okay? Clinically driven healthcare for the brain. We're getting into high cost, uh, the risk level, you know, we got to figure that out with oxygen therapy, but these buzzwords should make you concerned and put your hand on your wallet, okay? So what people who support hyperbaric say is that it's got all sorts of ways that it helps the brain. It can reduce inflammation, it stops brain cells from dying, it helps new, grow new brain cells, and it helps grow new blood vessels. The problem is, is that this is not supported by the evidence. Unfortunately, I would love nothing more than to sit here and tell you this was a great and accessible, low cost treatment that you could get through your insurance company, but unfortunately that is not the case. 
But we want to keep an open mind, right? Because sometimes the way we measure outcomes isn't perfect. Um, and maybe it's just been a little bit of a measurement error. Maybe they haven't done the research correctly to actually pick up on the effect. So let's go through the evidence and you come to your own conclusion. So there's been 40 years of evidence of looking at hyperbaric oxygen therapy on TBI, okay? But we have very little clinical evidence, unfortunately. So much of the research is done by the companies that make the chamber, so not good, conflict of interest. Many are done on either one person or very, very small groups of people. They often use subjective outcomes. So this is asking people when they get out, do you feel more mentally clear? Do you feel like you're finding your words better? And people want to get better. There's a huge literature on the placebo effect, right? And I think part of it with this treatment is it just makes such common sense. I know that I have a TBI because I had a loss of oxygen to the brain and you're going to give me more oxygen. So there's this real pull for this to want to be effective, but we just don't have the data to back it up. So um, what I wanted to do was to go through the data on uh, mild TBI and moderate to severe and tell you specifically what it is they have um, figured out. So um, within the world of science, um, and I, hopefully I've helped you guys understand this before, what we really want, the gold standard, is something called randomized clinical trials, right? And I wanna tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But from, as of 2017, there's only been eight studies as it relates to hyperbaric oxygen therapy using about maybe 500 people that has been considered good enough to actually draw scientific conclusions from. So people do things like meta-analyses and they decide, you know, this isn't really good enough quality. This was uh, funded so clearly by industry that we feel like it was biased. We're going to throw it out. But basically scientists have put together the really good data and we crunch all those numbers and we figure out what are the effects. So Bottom line is what they figured out is that in mild traumatic brain injury, we really don't have sufficient evidence to feel like this should be helpful, okay? Um, so there's three acceptable studies and only about 183 people in these studies where they compared the therapy to what they call a sham. So a sham is um, either putting someone in a chamber and having them think they're getting oxygen therapy or not offering them the treatment at all, not doing anything, and then just calling the folks on the phone, having them do tests and see who's got what long-term outcomes, okay. But remember what I said about mild TBI, after a few weeks, three months max, you shouldn't even have any symptoms. If you've had a mild TBI, what's most accurate is to say, I had a TBI. Concussion, mild TBI are the same terms. It's really not appropriate to say, I have a TBI. You are not really living with the neurological effects of a TBI until you've gotten into that moderate to severe stage. So a lot of scientists feel like it's not even appropriate to approach people with mild TBI to do these studies because after three months, what we really think is it's other things. It's orthopedic injury, it's emotional injury. So is there even really something there to treat? So that's an important thing to know. Um, so what the scientists, the experts have basically concluded is that there doesn't appear to be any added value in mild TBI to doing hyperbaric oxygen um, treatment. And so they said that they would give it their weakest recommendation, okay? Um, when you look at moderate to severe populations, there's only been four acceptable studies, three that they call low quality, and this is a total of 486 people. And what they figured out is that it does help people live. There is an increased mortality rate and a reduction in those Glasgow coma scales after someone has a moderate to severe TBI and they go into the oxygen chamber. Um, many of the studies that they used though were old, came from the 1970s. Our whole idea about the brain and brain trauma has changed a lot in the last 40 to 45 years. So the authors make the point that really hard to draw conclusions from these studies. But basically what they said is that hyperbaric oxygen therapy does seem to improve the chance that someone will live following a severe TBI. But if you're thinking what I'm thinking, we have to have the discussion about quality of life, okay? Life at any cost or life knowing that somebody can achieve a acceptable level of quality of life. So what are the basic conclusions, the current state of recommendations? The Department of Veteran Affairs, the Department of Defense, 
um, in a 2015 government accountability um, report came out and said that Unfortunately, hyperbaric oxygen therapy was no better than a placebo, no better than a sugar pill. This was repeated in June 2017 by an independent group of researchers who did a systematic review of all that data. And they said, they were a little bit more optimistic. They said, the current evidence does not clearly support any one argument over another. We simply do not know. Um, the authors of one of the meta-analysis said that the routine use of oxygen therapy for brain trauma can, quote, not be justified at this time. The strongest scientific support that this treatment has to date is in appearing, pardon me, improving the likelihood that you will live, okay? So again, no quality of life measures. It's simply, are you more likely to die or are you more likely to live if you have a severe TBI? and you get put in an oxygen chamber. So what do the people say on either side? So what are the pro people, right? You believe in hyperbaric oxygen therapy. What is it you would say? Well, you would say that the studies haven't been designed properly, um, that the control groups haven't really been clean, that they're using people who also have some brain issues going on, like post-traumatic stress disorder. They also feel like the placebo has not been fair. So sometimes what these studies have done is they'll use all of the perfect um, settings on the machine, 100% oxygen, a certain amount of air pressure for the, the treatment group, and then the sham or the control group, they'll maybe put them at like 80% oxygen. So some people are saying, look, both groups are getting better. That's why they don't look different. It doesn't look like one is actually getting more improved than the other one. Um, and they basically say, we just don't know. We need more of these randomized clinical studies. People on the con side are basically saying, look, we've done enough research, we consistently don't see significantly improved outcomes. It's basically a high-tech ritual that is very social. Remember I said before, this can be very social. So one of the things with TBI is you can become isolated. You maybe can't drive as much. People um, do tend to um, not get as in good touch with you once you've had any kind of a disabling injury, maybe especially a brain injury. And so the idea of going to these places, it can be, there's a lot of soothing power in being with other people. So they talk about very powerful placebo and social effects. They have the big concern of, okay, yes, it's saving lives, but at what cost? If you're in a vegetative state, if you're dependent on a ventilator, what quality of life is that? The people on the con side also don't know what the people on the pro side really think the, the, the mechanism of action is. What is the actual thing that's helping here? So is it the oxygen? Is it the pressure? Are both making a difference? Um, we, we have such a basic understanding of oxygen and brain injury, like I was saying before, that they, they want more of a scientific explanation just then it, it, it helps, right? Because we were so clear on what the actual trauma is in brain injury that they want that same level of detail and specificity on how it helps. So what are some of the potential risks? Okay, so most people um, talk in the literature about uh, inner and middle ear injuries, um, lung collapse, um, seizures as a result of getting too much oxygen, um, different issues with a change in the eye lens, um, cataracts growing a little bit faster, um, and then of course claustrophobia, they call it confinement anxiety, and then there's actually a risk of fire because of the oxygen-rich environment. Um, specific side effects for people who have TBI, um, they think that the risk of side effects goes up by about 2% and mostly it's within the middle ear trauma and effect on the sinuses. Um, in moderate to severe TBI, um, the biggest risk factor was a pulmonary complication, so that's some trouble with breathing. If we're gonna talk about this treatment, which you know clearly it's your decision, I'm trying to just inform you, we have to talk about access, right? So let's say you want it. You need to know where can I get it and how much does it cost? So the numbers of the number of places in the US has really grown. So there was basically 27 places in the early 70s that did it. And now we have more than 1300 hospital-based programs. 
I could not find a reliable estimate of how many standalone clinics or non-hospital facilities there were. But basically, facilities are part of a healthcare system that are well regulated. Um, you want to um, definitely find one that is associated with some kind of an academic or a hospital center. The closest one to me is about an hour and a half in one direction. That would be going up to Duke or UNC and that is more of the wound-based clinic and then the ones that do some of the more um, brain or mental health um, related treatments are in Wilmington, North Carolina. So kind of like two and a half hours one way, one, and one to one and a half hour up there. So how do you prepare? Well, you got to make sure that you're not going to do anything that's going to spark a flame, okay? So they make sure you don't bring in lighters, no battery-powered devices. You have to remove all hair and skincare products that have petroleum in there. Um, you will either go into a unit that's designed for one person. You can go in one that has several rooms. They can either put a mask on you or a clear hood that goes over your face. Um, during the treatment, some people tell me it feels like you're in an airplane and so you have that increased um, pressure fullness in your ears, just like if you were on a high mountain or on an airplane ride, you can relieve this by doing all the things you'd normally do, yawning, swallowing, chewing gum. Uh, most of the time the therapy lasts for about two hours and you're monitored by technicians the whole time. After people say that they feel maybe a little tired, a little bit hungry, but not to the point where you can't go on about your day. Insurance. So if you have one of those FDA approved conditions, it's more likely that your insurance will cover it. TBI is not covered for any type of insurance. The VA is working to have um, approval as a little bit more of an, an add-on or an experimental program for TBI related vets um, in VA centers specifically. And really they're gonna use that for research. Um, and they offer it at a reduced cost, which is nice. So people actually buy their own chamber. So you can get a soft chamber or a hard chamber. Um, the mild ones, uh, the soft ones, pardon me, uh, cost about $4,000. You can get them on Amazon, but people who are into this say the hard ones are really what you need to seal in the actual oxygen. Um, they typically in a facility will cost you about $250 a session or they offer Cost reduction at to uh, more sessions, so about $10,000 for 40 sessions. The standard is $20,000 for 80 sessions. So if you're gonna do it, I want you to try to find out about the safety history of the place. Look at the Better Business Bureau. You should find out about their service records. Do they have certified staff? Is there an on-site safety director um, who has gone through the safety director course? So what are the take home messages from all this information? Well, I think first of all, what do you think about the research? If you're someone who's very data driven, who's very scientifically minded and objective, I don't think the research is there. If you're somebody who is more interested in alternative therapies and feels like you can afford it and it's geographically accessible, I think the risk factor profile is relatively low. Um, and, and if you're gonna do it, I say go all in and do it and fully believe that it's gonna work. Use that power of placebo effect to your benefit. I want you to not not do other treatments that we know are definitely going to help, like speech therapy, like physical therapy, like exercise, okay? Talk it over with a medical professional that you trust. And remember, there's other ways to get oxygen into your body, and this is a great way for us to wrap it up. Exercise, right? Brain blood flow is definitely shown to increase during easy to moderate exercise. Interestingly enough, if you exercise too intensely, we think that actually decreases the amount of oxygen in the brain because the blood is being redistributed throughout the body to reduce the body temperature. Isn't that interesting? Practicing and mastering deep breathing. This is probably the most portable and easy way that we have to regulate our central nervous system, really understanding deep diaphragmatic breathing as well as you can. Reducing stress. When we're stressed, we are shallow breathing. That is reducing the amount of oxygen in our body. Certain foods can help you improve the availability of oxygen in your body and in your brain. You wanna focus on iron rich foods that are high quality, meats that are grass fed, fish that come from natural clean oceans as much as you can, uh, beans, green leafy vegetables, I almost said greefy lean vegetables, 
Um, you want to make sure you treat low or high blood pressure. Remember the blood is the deliverer of the oxygen, so you want good blood flow. Looking for an iron deficiency the next time you go to your doctor. Um, listening to um, your body, if you're tired, if you're fatigued, if you get weak easily, that probably means you have some type of reduced availability of oxygen. So you wanna to talk to your doctor, get your thyroid checked. Low thyroid can reduce um, overall body circulation. And of course, it wouldn't be right if we didn't talk about prevention with TBI. I don't care if you've had zero TBIs or 10 TBIs, you want to avoid TBI, right? So how do we do this? Well, remember at first, I told you about 30 to 80% of people are drinking alcohol when they get their TBI. So if you're gonna drink, don't do risky things, stay put. Um, you want to, of course, use helmets. Use your seatbelt every single time. Um, avoid falling. The kitchen and the bathroom are the, the biggest dangers in the home. You wanna make sure you're fit and strong. You wanna increase your core strength. So that way, if you do fall, you have the ability to fall well and not have more of a physical injury than you would otherwise. Remember that rehab never, never ends when you have a TBI. If you feel like you've plateaued or gosh, you know, I've tried everything, this is where a neuropsychologist can come in because we love to evaluate people no matter where they are in the recovery spectrum and give personalized brain health recommendations that are gonna help push you over past that plateau to help you know what should I do to get a return on the efforts that I'm putting out. So I hope that that was helpful to you all, educational to you all. I had a really interesting time researching it. Um, I think for me personally, as a uh, board certified neuropsychologist, I can't recommend this treatment to my patients at this time, but I always try to think about it, you know, what if it was me who had a TBI? And the truth is, if I had the money and I had a place close to my house, I'd probably think, why not try it, right? I think the risk is low enough that I would wanna, wanna see if it had an effect, but I would make sure that I also was doing all the other things that my doctor and science tells me is, is gonna work probably more likely. If you thought that this was helpful, it would really be awesome for us if you would share it. We do this to try to alleviate suffering in the brain health communities through education and empowerment. So I think a lot of people out there are at the mercy of the marketers, and I just wanna be a nice, loud, clear voice to help you understand what is actually happening behind the scenes in all of these promises. Thank you guys so much, and I will be back here next Wednesday. Take care, bye-bye.